So my name is uh, Brian McCaddy, and I'm uh, one of the board members here at the Sources of Knowledge Forum, the program chair for this year. And as you know, this is the 10th annual Sources of Knowledge uh, Forum. So I wonder if I can have a round of applause for the 10th effort that we've made. Yeah. And it's just such an impressive uh, initiative that's, that's gone on. I, uh, I just wanted to uh, take a moment just to, to list the uh, original board members, uh, many of whom are still very active, which is a good measure of an organization when you've got that kind of commitment. And I think some of them are here today, actually. So I'll, let me list them uh, overall, and then maybe uh, I may ask a few of them to stand if they're here uh, this morning, and then maybe we can recognize them. So uh, as you know, uh, many of you know, I think that this uh, organization began, the Source of Knowledge began, with the Parks Advisory Committee, the National Parks Advisory Committee, who uh, began meeting uh, over 10 years ago and uh, decided that uh, in addition to the work with parks that they would do on a regular basis, <clears throat> they wanted to have a way to, to get information across. Uh, the, the incredible research that's done in the national parks, the knowledge that's created in the parks, uh, to get that across once a year at a forum. And it was an incredible idea at that time. Of course, a lot more to it than I'm uh, saying right now in my opening remarks, and we may hear more uh, throughout the weekend, but just a, a tremendous visionary uh, initiative, and I'll just list some of the people who were involved in the, in the very early uh, days. Uh, uh, Gord Nelson, Dr. Gord Nelson, Bill Caulfield-Brown, Howie Froelich, Sean LaPere, Daryl Cowell, Bill Graham, Arlene Kennedy, Scott Parker, Dr. Scott Parker, and Darcy Lombard. They were the original board members, and I hope I've got everybody on there. Round of applause for them. And I wonder if I could just ask the, uh, the board members uh, who are here today, who are on that list, to stand up for a moment. Uh, uh, don't be shy. Uh, great. Number of folks. It's great to see everybody still involved in, in, that, uh, in, in today's work. So the other thing I wanted to mention, just in opening remarks, uh, just some logistical things, I guess, at the beginning. Make sure you hang on to your coffee cups, if you can, for the, the coffee throughout the day so we don't have to wash them uh, every uh, half an hour or something like that. Only so many cups uh, back there. So please do that. Uh, and thanks to John Greenhouse for getting the coffee going. Possibly the most important person in the house. Uh, that's always a honored position to be in. And I wanted to point to my right, uh, over on the stage there, the uh, Bruce Peninsula Society of Artists. Mary Ambrose is here somewhere. Mary, you can just wave uh, in the back uh, row there. Uh, Mary and uh, Jackie Lutz, our coordinator, uh, have put together the, uh, the art show. Those pieces of art are for sale. Uh, so please, throughout the forum, have a look uh, at those and buy art. <laughs> Art's important to buy, not just look at. And at this point, I'd like to, um, to call on our uh, uh, opening, uh, providing uh, uh, opening remarks from the municipality, our, our Deputy Mayor, uh, Patricia Gray. Uh, Patricia is also, as you know, uh, the uh, Niagara Escarpment Commission Commissioner for this area as well, following in the footsteps of, uh, of Councillor Tom Boyle, who's also here this morning. Patricia, opening remarks, please. Thank you, Brian, and thanks to the Sources of Knowledge for this invitation. I'd like to echo some of the things that Brian said, that this is a truly impressive event. It, I think, has become one of the premier events and officially kicks off summer on the, on the Bruce Peninsula. So, uh, welcome. On behalf of the municipality, Milt sends his regrets. He couldn't be here this morning. But Tom Boyle is here. Tom, stand up. Tom, Tom has been one of the strong supporters of the environment and the biosphere and the sources of knowledge, and he brings that to council on a, on a weekly basis. So, uh, again, welcome to Northern Bruce Peninsula. I think you've got a wonderful day ahead. As usual, 
the topics are thought-provoking and most important, relevant to the future of the peninsula. Thank you. Thanks very much, Patricia. Patricia has been here for many years attending this forum as well, which we really appreciate. And, and I should point out that uh, Councillor Boyle, Tom Boyle, is on the board of the Source of Knowledge and, and has been for uh, a number of years. So we have great support from our local uh, politicians, which is very important. Uh, our second uh, uh, series of opening remarks is from Catherine Patterson, who's the uh, Field Unit Superintendent for Parks Canada. Covers uh, the area that uh, uh, is throughout Georgian Bay and all the way down into eastern Ontario, including Ottawa. So, a huge area in terms of the number of historic sites, as you can imagine, and, and national parks, an important area. And I want to just to briefly say that again, remember this came from the Parks Advisory Committee, the source of knowledge. So, we've always had a very strong relationship with Parks Canada. We have a couple of board members, uh, uh, Kevin Harper and Lenore Kishik, uh, on the Source of Knowledge Board, who are Parks Canada employees. And uh, that relationship continues to get stronger 10 years in. And in fact, uh, Parks Canada is, is, is offering additional funding to help the Source of Knowledge uh, grow. Uh, and we're just talking about the details of that, uh, <laughs> but we'll, you'll hear more about that as, as time goes on. But that's uh, just the kind of commitment that Parks Canada has made to, to our initiative here which came from the parks to begin with. So it's just nice to reflect uh, on that 10 years in uh, as we move ahead. So I can ask Catherine to come forward and make some comments from Parks Canada. Good morning, everyone. It's, a, it's truly a pleasure to be here. I think I, uh, my first sources of knowledge was in 2014, and that was the underwater and archaeology and diving. It was absolutely fascinating. And I've made it to three of the past five, but just want to... Uh, say congratulations on, uh, on uh, 10 years, um, 10 years, and it's wonderful to be here today in the village of Tobermory in the traditional territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe uh, Nation. John Festerini, who is our acting superintendent right now at the Bruce Peninsula in Fathom 5, couldn't be here today. Before he took on the assignment to to move up here, he already had commitments in Ottawa, so he was very excited and very disappointed at the same time. So I'm just making some remarks on on uh, on his behalf. So um, I, I uh, realize we got started off late, so I'll try to keep my comments short. And uh, I'm not a speaker; I'm just kind of an opening remark. So if you have any questions, I'm sure you might. I'm going to be here the whole weekend and happy. To answer your your friendly questions, your tough and challenging ones. Uh, that's what I'm here for. So, so we. I just wanted to share maybe our strategic intent for the future is to stop. Um, over the past three years, actually, has been very purposely to get from behind the eight ball and to start leading the way. But we want to do that very humbly. We have a lot to learn. I was in Washington D.C. last week trying to trying to figure out how the National Park Service in the U.S. is handling its top 10 loved-to-death parks, and they have the same congestions we do, and same kind of uh, same kind of challenges. So, and when I say we want to start to lead the way, we, we say so humbly because we we are also want to become less of an island and become an amazing partner. We really count on the Saugeen and Ojibwe Nation, the municipality, the Park Advisory Committee, the our the RTO, the um, Bruce Peninsula Environmental Group. And we're enjoying really great initiatives and really great new friendships with all of those groups. If we're not being a good partner and there's room to improve, I want to hear about this because we really want to, we really want to improve on that, uh, on that uh, front. And um, so, uh, so we like, yeah, we want to um, move ahead. Some things that have happened in the past um, four or five years, you may not be aware of. We've added $25 million of investment into the park, and we've booked another $8 million. Um, that $8 million, I don't know if we'll get it or not, but if you don't ask and you don't try to book some funding, it doesn't happen. We have more than doubled the team. The team we have today, um, the team we had in 2014 is... 40% of the one we have today. So that is a huge doubling that hasn't happened anywhere else in the park 
system, but it happened here. And, and that is everything from safety to people picking up garbage to people like uh, Brian, Sean LaPere, and Megan, who we've added to add strategic and planning capacity. So we're not just scrambling to keep up with the garbage and beautiful washrooms, which I think we're doing an amazing job, um, but to have some foresight as well. Our visitor complaints are down 80% over the past three, three years, and we're getting much more positive reviews. As you can imagine, we're still very concerned I, with, about congestion and managing that and getting ahead of the demand. I emailed our external relations manager this morning. There's a darn group called NAR City, and they're just clickbait yeah. bloggers. And they had another article this morning saying, head up to the grotto. They share the beautiful stock images of the gorgeous water. And there's no link there to say plan ahead or there's new things this year. So that is a, that is a challenge. Our team have also spent four years working on a legislative framework so we could actually have tighter regulations over Fathom 5. Unlike some of the other NMCAs in the country, we don't, uh, we don't uh, because of you know, the ongoing um, um, land uh, claims and litigation of Soggy and Ojibwe and the province, the province never transferred over the lake bed or anything. And that means we are unable to manage and apply the Canada National Parks Act so we are concerned about uh, operations and traffic and new or fly-by-night uh, businesses starting up um, and maybe not even working with us. Uh, so we have to keep ahead of that. But we have worked for four years and we finally have some tight regulations for the actual shipwreck areas. But that's how long it takes just to tweak and get some little acts and schedules into place and we continue to work to work on that and to license the operations. Other NMCAs actually license every traffic, every vessel, every shipping lane that goes through their places, and we hope to get uh, to that, that place in future. Looking ahead, we're also entering management planning right now. We do want to be deeply consultative about that. So management planning starts out with a report card. We're at the report card phase. Are we being a good partner? What are our ecosystems like? What are our marine indicators like? And we're doing that report card and working through with our partners. Do they agree on the way all of those ratings um, look? The next part of that is called scoping, and that is where we really need all of our partners to, to help us and to kind of agree and find some al alignment. The scoping sets the guideposts and the direction for where we head next over the next 10 to 15 year period. So whatever those scoping high level themes come out, they're, they're really important because they're the parameters for where we go in the future. And that will not be done in secret, that will be done with extensive public consultations and, uh, and with our partners and uh, forging the way ahead. We're also... Um, Brian and Sean, who are here today, are also working on the visitor experience strategy. And we think these, it might sound a bit bureaucratic, but we think these documents are really important. Because when people ask us to shut down one kind of industry, or allow another, or to head in a certain direction, it can seem pretty arbitrary if it just comes down to me deciding yes, no. When we have documents that people have, have aligned behind in their grassroots, and that's our blueprint for going forward. It gives us some teeth to our decisions and some moral kind of justification for why we're heading in, into a direction in a legal framework. So that all of that is coming and we'll be very proactive about reaching out about those uh, things. The last thing I think I wanted to, to mention or talk about is conservation. Um, I would say conservation has been neglected at the Bruce for the past few years. And before that sounds really insulting to our very fine scientists in the room today, what I mean by that is I remember my first summer here job shadowing and, and then again in 2015, and I saw, I've used this over, so Kevin might be embarrassed the amount of times I've used it, but I saw him in a reflective vest with walkie-talkies running up and down managing traffic on Emmett Lake Road and giving overtime and weekends to that. And when we were pulling our science team to scrambling to keep up to visitor experience, 
guess what, that room for innovation and that creative thinking and growth didn't happen. Their team actually shrunk over the past few years, losing a scientist, and, and Scott Parker has joined our national office team. So one thing I've asked the team to do, there's an old saying, um, you, know, for, you know, I don't think fortune rewards chance, I think fortune rewards preparedness. And any time we've prepared and had a strong vision for the future, I find resources and money magically seem to be attracted to, to that crystallization of a vision. So what we've asked Kevin's team, and he's already thinking and working on it, if we were going to be world class up here, if we were going to provide maybe some umbrella type of, of work across the whole Great Lakes system and for climate change, what would that look like? I have no sense, there's, nobody has asked us to do this in national office. I have no sense that any money is even coming our way. But if we imagine it is, I think it might, or I think it will. Um, our minister also announced a $1.4 billion uh, fund for conservation. It's the biggest announcement, I think, ever of its kind. And some of our partners may actually know more than Parks Canada does about how that is is trickling out or how that's being doled out. But here's, here's an example. Um, whether we get the money here or not, money in the conservation system helps everybody. So the 25, so in a little smaller scale, the $25 million that is here at the Bruce, that's helped my field unit. You bet your boots that means that Bellevue House and Laurier House in Ottawa have nicer gardens and better roofs because the Bruce isn't sucking from my tiny little local budget just to keep up. It's got its own money. So if some of the bigger areas or the Arctic or other places have money, guess what? That means it's going to free up money for these local initiatives. So I'm super excited about where conservation is going to be going at the Bruce Peninsula and Fathom 5. And I've told the team to dream big and the sky's the limit. I also want to manage expectations because we might only be able to tackle 25% of their dream, you know, in year one or two. But, uh, you know, you put it out there. Wayne Gretzky said skate to where the puck is going. Um, I'm saying we're, we're going to skate to where Kevin and, and uh, Martha is the new, you know, kind of uh, up and coming ResCon manager. Skate to where what they uh, pencil out on flip charts and white whiteboards. Um, we're skating to, work, to that uh, vision. And I'm pretty sure you want to weigh in on that. So... Thanks very much and hope you have a wonderful weekend. I am thrilled to be here. So a really exciting uh, future for Parks Canada. And it's great for all of us to, to hear. Uh, we uh, Moving on to the next one because I realize we're a little bit behind, but we'll catch up uh, during the morning. Uh, one of our uh, board members, uh, who I'm sure many people in this room know, uh, has been Batten, who has been a great board member for us, also a board member for BPEG, I believe as well, the Bruce Peninsula Environment Group, and of course active uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with the Nature Conservancy of Canada, uh, working here in the peninsula. So we're very lucky to have Esme, and I'd like to ask Esme uh, this morning to introduce our first speaker, uh, who we're very excited to have, uh, Chief uh, Greg Najawan uh, from Nayashnamang, uh, who uh, was, was here last year and, and has, has been involved with a source of knowledge, uh, very involved in parks activities, as you can imagine, and uh, a number of uh, things throughout the peninsula. So that's a real coup for us to have uh, Chief Najawan this morning. And Esme, can I ask you to come up and introduce the Chief? It's great to see so many happy, smiling faces this early, but probably thanks to lots of coffee. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker today, Chief Greg Najwan from the Chippewas of Nawash and Seed First Nations uh, from Nishingame. And we're really lucky to have him here today. He sat on council for a number of years as well as been the chief for a number of years. And he's going to be speaking today about the future of the Saguin Peninsula and his thoughts on that topic. I'd like to introduce Chief Greg Najwan. Good morning. Ooh. I guess we never notice uh, how nervous we are until we're there. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a little nervous. At, uh, and I, uh, at one time I thought Catherine Patterson was a very good friend of mine, but 
Apparently she set the benchmark quite high this morning for somebody that wasn't a public speaker. Uh, Catherine, as you can see by the, the uh, talk she gave here, is, is very passionate. And I'm uh, very fortunate to have uh, met Catherine a few years ago. And uh, we have a few talks through the year. Catherine, we may not agree on everything, but the dialogues are interesting. <laughs> and I thank everyone for, uh, and I welcome you to the, uh, the peninsula. The peninsula in the day was the, uh, in order as the Saugeen Peninsula, and I hope that someday we can revert back to using that as a, as a hallmark of uh, reconciliation with First Nation people in the, in the territory. That would be a, an excellent start. I know some of the councillors, I know Councillor Tom Boyle from, uh, I used to stop at the restaurant all the time to get my uh, sausage uh, for uh, my fishing trips when I was going up for the for a long weekend. It was, uh, my kids said, oh, we got to stop there. We, so we had to, even though we started early, we used to have to delay and wait for the store to open so we could get our, <laughs> our rations. And uh, I'd advise anyone to stop there to, to uh, get that, I call it a luxury item. <laughs> so, uh, Brian, I, I met uh, probably a couple of years ago and we were discussing initiatives with uh, First Nation and maybe how we could uh, work together, partnership or or how he could assist, and he's a, he's a go-getter. He's, he's always a, on the ball, so to speak, uh, wanting to uh, see where we're at in uh, promoting any initiative that has been mentioned. One of them has been, and we're, we're in the starting blocks, is in the, uh, to uh, a proposal for an interpretive center for First Nations leading into the uh, into the peninsula. As I said, it's it's something we're looking long and hard at. We're looking at acquiring a, and this is kind of a a little different. First Nations looking at acquiring a, some land to uh, promote this, <laughs> especially in the. The, the territory where we have a big uh, claim in court. <laughs> that claim has taken so long, we're saying, well, we're going to uh, quick start this. But it, I think it's much needed. And an interpretive assist, uh, center is needed for a lot of reasons. And the biggest rationale I, I have for having an interpretive center is to explain the, the history the history of this land that is the peninsula. It's needed coming out of the peninsula and the history, the true history, the real history of indigenous people in this land is needed in the schools. It's still not there, we're still not there. So anytime we, we get into the, into the arena of inherent rights, it's a big fight. And a lot of that fight is because a lot of the people are, uh, a lot of the young people are un unaware of the real history. Our real role has been part and parcel of the development of, the, of this land called Canada. So it's one of the uh, one of the areas where I get excited about when we uh, int introduce and promote our own history in our own community. And hopefully we can take that history and extend it to the schools and in the catchment area. It would make race relations so much easier, so much better, so much more if we have a whole lot more in common than we, than we don't. And uh, I just want to take, on a, take a moment to uh, speak on, uh, on our lack of consideration when it comes to conservation. 
So recently, this spring, there was a big issue uh, regard, regarding a small bird that is an endangered species and is on the brink of extinction, the piping plover. So, and I do meet with the mayors, and I had met with Mary Janice Jackson, and I said, please don't always leave it to First Nations to be at the forefront when it comes to areas of protection. We have, we have to work together. I was, I mean, I realize the mayor is responsible for a, lot, a, a large population, and the economy is, is part of what drives the the Chamber of Commerce and businesses. But I also realize that as people, we have a responsibility for the protection of species, animals, and plants that have no one to speak for them but the people in this room. And it's time that uh, when we have an opportunity for protection that we stand together. And, and speak loud and why it's necessary. First, the piping plover. What, what's, what's next? The saga rattlesnake. Bear population of the peninsula. The orchids, which are, are, are numerous. One of the uh, things that draws naturalists to the area. So that's Nobody else's responsibility but ours. And we can do this in the, in, with method. I realize that, you know, the economy does drive a lot of things. But I, I would hate to see the day when your grandchildren, the only way they can see a piping plover or a Mississauga rattlesnake is by going to a, a museum and reading about what used to be, what we used to have, what was predominant in the area. So I know I'm aware of it. I know I uh, try to speak for the protection of, of the uh, ecology and the environment. And uh, I think we owe it to nobody else but ourselves. So uh, I'm glad that uh, Catherine had uh, spoken to cons conservation and as, as to uh, a direction that the park also, uh, road it also intends to go down. I know Brian wanted me to focus heavily on the interpretive center, but I can't let too much out of, <laughs> out of the bag other than to say we're looking for a place and uh, it is on the radar. My intentions are not to let it off the radar and to push until we, we, we have that established. So, I would also like to uh, get back to the uh, conservation. Because uh, I spent a lot of time on the water. I mean a lot of time on the water. And I've noticed more changes, and I brought it to the attention of others in the, the crown, that in the last five years I've seen more change in the area where I'm on than I have probably for the previous 50. And this water is changing so fast. The concerns are multiplying so quick. We're now just feeling the true impact of the invasion of a invasive species, the mussels. And we're getting a double whammy. The mussels have now filtrated the water to the point of there's no protoplankton and plankton and, and, and food necessary for the growth of fishes, the natural species of fish. They're at risk. They're at, uh, real risk of uh, being uh, a thing of the past. The water clarity, on the one hand, it seems that we can go out off, 
off the shoals or into Georgian Bay and, and see how clear the water is. On one hand it looks beautiful, on the other hand it's allowed sunlight to penetrate the depths that it never did in this body of water before. And because, it's, because of that factor, a result of the muscles filtrating the water to that extent, we're now uh, experiencing big algae plumes in the water, which more than natural phenomenon in the in the bays, and and that is now also becoming a real real concern of all types of people who utilize the water. These algae plumes. I'm no scientist, but I do know they're toxic, and. Uh, so you can see, uh, if we look back to the first time this, uh, this group met, ten years ago, in that ten years how much things have changed in the Songhean Peninsula and, and on the shores and the waters of, off the peninsula, on both sides, Lake Huron and Georgian Bay. Never before has a change really happened this fast. And so when regulations are, are talked about, they're for the, the betterment of, uh, of all, because we have to be smart enough to, to not only consider and be selfish <coughs> about what this land and water offers to us in our lifetime, what's it going to be like, what's, what's it going to be for our grandchildren? What experience are they going to be able to have on the land and on the water? So these are all things that uh, I think long and hard about. I know uh, what my position is on it. Mine is one where I said that uh, this is an opportunity. We've got to grab the bull by the horns and wrestle it to the ground. We have to be adamant in for the protection. Stewardship is a responsibility of those on the land. And if you have a cottage, a house, a place on this land, that is isn't only the First Nations uh, responsibility. It's the responsibility of the constituency to do the right thing and the smart thing. <coughs> and I like the Sources of Knowledge uh, platform. You get together and you talk about the real issues. Not the fact that we're trying to, uh, to stop people from coming into the territory. But when they come into the territory and, and the experiences they uh, participate in are ones that leave the smallest footprint possible but also that, that take the land and the water into consideration. And uh, I don't think any other generation has had this, this degree of responsibility. If you look at the satellite map of Ontario, the only real pristine ecological environment in that, in this part of the province, is the peninsula north of Highway 21. That's a that's a fact. But we also have a lot of entrepreneurs that are moving into the into the area for development. I'm not saying that they can't participate in business. But it has to be one with method. It has to be done with method. Our big uh, presence in making quarry owners accountable isn't to stop the, uh, the production of, of, of gravel or, or, or stone. It's just we want the big picture. The big picture shown. 
we want to know what effects quarries have on ground groundwater. Their proximity to other dump dump sites. How is it? Is it going to? Uh, are the adverse effects going to outnumber the advantages? And that's the scale we have to weigh everything on. And again, I said, never before has there been a generation that have had so many obligations and responsibilities put on their plate as, as the population I'm looking at and speaking with today. So um, I just want us all to be cognizant of it. I'll be prepared to sit down and and mull over the, the hard questions, how we, how we go forward. I had discussions with the parks people, and uh, we, we posed some hard questions. We posed the, is it necessary for the introduction of a lot of uh, asphalt and concrete on, on surfacing paths, and uh, how will that look in the future? I mean, I can pinpoint one of the seven wonders of the world called Niagara Falls. There wasn't a lot of uh, long-term thinking in the development around Niagara Falls. <laughs> you know? But there can be long-term thinking about the development of the parks and the peninsula. And we, we might not be around to be uh, thanked or congratulated for our concerns, but I can say if we do it right, it'll be historical. <coughs> and uh, well, all, we can all say that uh, we were there, and where. So having I had said that, I'm going to cut it short because I want to bring the, uh, the timeline back into the, the time frame allotted to some of the speakers that have come from far and wide. And again, uh, I appreciate coming up and, and having an opportunity to uh, say my piece. I get spanked an awful lot, being sometimes a little too outspoken, but what's, what's the odd spanking, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thank you for the invite, and uh, much success in the rest of the day and the rest of the weekend.